Professor Skinner, we're here today to talk about verbal behavior, mm -hmm. the book by that name and the behavior of that name. Your book, Verbal Behavior, in which you set forth a behavioral account of language, strikes me as one of the great theoretical works of 20th century science, certainly the most important treatise on mind since the great British empirical philosophers, Locke and the rest, had their say on the topic. Do you object to my calling verbal behavior a treatise on mind and human understanding, terms borrowed from philosophy? I don't think so. It certainly is a book about how we talk about behavior and our own behavior. And the concept of mind could never have arisen until we reached the point at which we uh, talked about what we were doing. As I, I can't imagine that pre-verbal human organisms or any other species in the world ever ask itself, why did I do that? You, uh, you do things, and if successful, you do them again. If not, you don't do them again, and so on. But under what conditions could you ever say to yourself, why did I do that? It's got to be verbal. You've got to start talking about yourself and others. Now, the first answer to that question, I think, must have come from noticing something inside your body as you were behaving. Oh, I must have done that because of the way I felt. I think it was only, uh, my guess is it would be when histories began to be written that you began to see sequences of events in which something else might explain the behavior, namely something that already happened. And that would explain the feelings that you have, what, what you're feeling in your body, and hence the behavior. But I think it's only it's only because we do talk about behavior that we understand what we call our mind. And that means that verbal behavior must have come before we had a mind, if there is such a thing, before we spoke about how we feel, why we did things, what, 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 our, what our states of mind were, what our thoughts were, and so on. Those are verbal constructs. Mm -hmm. But behavior is quite something else. It's what we do in the world as a result of genetic and personal history, what has happened to the species and what has happened to us as individuals. Well, near the end of verbal behavior, you have the statement, which I found startling the first dozen times I read it. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but it goes something like, thinking is behaving, as though they were really just two names for the same process. Uh, yes. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I am uh, what the philosophers would call a monist in the sense that I believe that I am nothing but a member of a particular, uh, a particular evolved species. And uh, nothing of any other kind uh, of thing exists in me. I've got to explain everything I do in terms of what will eventually come down to biochemical changes and the people in the nervous system will, will, will get onto those better. But up to beyond that, I can only suppose that I do things in the sense of acting upon the world and only when that world has certain features at a given time because of what has happened to me. Now, if I see you, I just, I'm just seeing you but not doing anything more. I've just stopped talking for a bit and I'm just sit there seeing you. Well, what is that except what is happening in my head when you are stimulating my eyes in a particular way. Now, if I were studying you as a pure sensation, a spot of red or something like that, I would probably trace it to genetics, what is going on in the, in the eye that leads me to see red. But since you are very much more than that, I would have to explain what I now see in terms of what has happened to me in the past many hundreds of times as I've talked with you. That is the difference between perception and, and the sensation. But it's all still what I am doing because of my genetic endowment, my eyes, and nerve systems, and so on, and my past history. Now, I can close my eyes, and I'm still seeing you. 
I'm not doing it very well. I do it much better with my eyes open, but I still do it. And what I am doing is what I am doing with my eyes open. It's the same activity in my nervous system. I have no information about that. And a long time in the future, uh, the physiologist will have a very clear picture of what it is. But it is something that I do, and I've, I've done it because it was very important for uh, a member of a species in the past to see things and get out of the way or eat them up, whatever, whatever the case was. And therefore, for, for individuals uh, to do the same things, thanks to a different process of selection, namely operant conditioning. Uh, it's part of my activity, and in the very broadest sense, that is what behaving is, doing what I am doing. Well, um, a common view in psychology, not, not our view, I think, mm -hmm. is that uh, the true subject matter of psychology is some inner process of thought that lies behind yeah. behavior. And behavior mm -hmm. is often mm -hmm. thought of as um, a mere symptom, almost a trivial byproduct of yeah. this inner yeah. thinking process. Yes. What, do you, what do you make then of that inner outer distinction? Well, I think the reason that we now question the inner thing, the reason there has been a behavioristic revolution, is that we now know more about the behavior. Up until 1913 at least, no one seriously said that you can forget about these internal things and look at the behavior. But that was only possible because people had begun to study behavior. Now, behaviorism didn't amount to much for 25 years because we didn't know much about it, about what people do. Rats ran through mazes and uh, dogs salivated the bells and whatnot. But that was, there was no real science of the behavioral antecedents of behavior, of the environmental antecedents of behavior. Once they had been discovered and very carefully worked out, there was something else to explain what we do in addition to what we're feeling. And then you realize that once you have a science of behavior which establishes the role of the environment, two, two sciences really, ethology, the role of natural selection, and experimental analysis of behavior is the role of the environment of the individual through operant conditioning. Once you have that science, then there's less need to look inside for a cause, and eventually you can simply say there's no need at all, because what is inside is the product of the history. So that what happens is, as I grew up as a, as a baby and a child and an adult, was that my body was slowly changed by contingency to reinforcement. It remained a, a body produced by natural selection. And that as soon as we understand the environmental sources of what I do all the way along, we don't need to bother about how it, how it feels when I'm doing it. But what, is, what philosophers have done for two and a half thousand years at least is to try to look more and more, more and more closely at what they feel or what they see introspectively. And of course, they never have got anywhere. And they, they, Plato was still taught today in departments of philosophy, you see, 2,500 years later. And moreover, the, uh, the, the cognitive psychology has given up on introspection. The psychology in general has. Do you, do you find a psychologist sitting around observing mental life anymore? No. The cognitive processes are inferences, which you establish by hypotheses and, uh, and inferences and so on. I don't know of a single psychologist who sits around and watches a stream of consciousness or is a trained observer in the Wundtian tradition. No, the behavioristic attack on introspection has been totally successful. Introspection is now out as a process of science. It's still there with philosophy, and they can have it. And uh, they will, uh, but the good philosophers, uh, uh, I would say someone like Bertrand Russell, I think, realizes that you can't get much out of introspection, although it's interesting to look at yourself when you're thinking, but you've got eventually to get back to uh, physical explanation. You say look at yourself when you're thinking. I mean, you, I think, of all people in psychology have been uh, a paragon 
of what can be accomplished, what one can accomplish with themselves when they look at themselves. I mean, you, you are always, it seems to me, analyzing your own behavior and trying to uh, plan your environment to get maximum production and, and enjoyment out of your oh, life. Well, yes, because it's not that I want to find out how to think better. I find out under what conditions do I think better. And that's very different. I, what is left to me at 84 is very little, uh, except to go on with what I've done. I, the, the, the thing I enjoy most is thinking. When I'm at my desk, when I've not eaten too much or too tired talking to people and so on, at my desk, I, that is, I'm, I'm, I'm never, never happier. Uh, it is just a wonderful state to be in, especially when the sentences do come out and so on and so on. Now, I don't do that by screwing up my courage at the sticking place and think. I arrange my personal history for the preceding 24 hours to get that state. And of course, I have to look at the state. I watch myself. I see myself saying things. This is uh, what I learned to do as a member of a species which specializes in self-observation. And I don't question the importance of this. I would advise therapists to be behavior therapists, not psychotherapists, to change the world that pe in which people live, not their minds or their feelings. But I would say, for heaven's sake, ask people how they feel. Ask people what they're going to do or what their, their intentions are. That's the best way you can get information about their history. But you're not getting at the initial cause. And I am not changing the initial causes in my behavior. I'm changing the external causes, mm -hmm. which cause me to be in a state when I am most productive as a thinker. Well, okay, okay. what do you mean then by thinking? Let's come back to that question when, of thinking and behaving. What is the kind of thing? What do you mean by the thinking that you do? Well, there's a whole difference between the cognitive idea that I'm, when I'm there, I'm retrieving something, retrieving thoughts, like remembering a name. Do you retrieve a name from memory? I don't think so at all. When you go through the alphabet to prompt yourself, you work to get the name to come. But you don't go like, in a filing cabinet and pull it out uh, or go dial a computer and have it appear on the screen. You don't retrieve. The whole idea that uh, retrieving information that the cognitive psychologist talks about is ridiculous. We don't retrieve. We, we try to create conditions in which something happens. And when I'm writing a paper, I have an outline, a topic, and I have a lot of other things all arranged in a useful file and so on. I do everything I can to get that next sentence out. But I don't compose it. I don't search for it. I don't re retrieve it from some mess of memories or anything like that. Then, then do you not, are you not responsible for your own thinking? No, of course not. No, well, we're not responsible for anything we do except in the ethical sense that we, we have been taught by our culture to take steps so that we don't do certain kinds of things. And if we haven't taken those steps, we are held responsible. I would hold them responsible. We're not teaching us to take them, but that's another matter. Uh, in the long run, uh, I think behavior is simply what various complicated biochemical systems do under certain circumstances. And um, I don't think... Uh, a biochemical system acts in order to achieve a goal. <laughs> it acts in certain ways and with a given result. Well, that brings me to another question I, <laughs> I wanted well, to ask you about. Uh, if, about midway through verbal behavior, there is a statement uh, that for me has always summed up one of the book's chief lessons. I'm paraphrasing again, but it, but it roughly goes, the speaker is a locus where variables come together to produce their effect. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody else in the world has ever talked about a speaker um, as a locus. What do you mean by that odd turn of phrase? Well, precisely what I've just said. Um, when I say something, I'm saying it right now. I wouldn't be saying it if I were a chimpanzee. Uh, my, the history of the human species is all here, helping me do this. That's not me, though. I, I am a product of that. And uh, if anything starts because 
of my genetics. It starts because of my genetics and not because of me. Now, what I say also is the product of an enormously long history of things I've read, things I've heard, things I've said, things I've done, and so on. They have changed me, changed that genetic endowment in such a way that I am answering your questions in the way I am. But that isn't anything starting within me either. If, if I had not known about the role of contingencies of reinforcement or natural selection, I would have had to suppose that things originated in me. And that was the case prior to Darwin and the behaviorism. But having then seen how selection by consequences will produce the body that I have here when at birth, or slightly before perhaps, and how the process of operant condition, which is an evolved process, has changed that body throughout my lifetime so that it behaves this way, there's nothing left in there of a B.F. Skinner saying anything. I am that person saying this now, but I am not originating. I am a place in which a genetic and a personal history have come together to produce what I'm saying. But I am a locus, and I, I feel no, I, it doesn't seem to threaten me at all. I don't feel robbed of any dignity, by putting it that way. Why do you think so many people do feel robbed? If you, if you tell, mm. I find with undergraduates, mm. if, if you try to teach the doctrine that you've just been uh, uh, yeah. explaining, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> they resent it. And they, they feel that their, their freedom, that their joy in life, mm. uh, yeah. their purpose for being mm. has been taken away mm. from them. Well, it all depends on what's taken away. <laughs> A juvenile delinquent is all too happy to have you say, well, I feel sorry for you, really, you shouldn't be punished because you had a bad background, you grew up in a, in a bad place and so on, and your father neglected you and your mother was off on the town or something. Now, that's why you're a delinquent and we'll, we'll have to forgive you. It's not your fault. But now supposing you're talking to a very good basketball player and he's saying, you really are very good, but remember, you're six feet seven tall you had a wonderful coach in high school. You got a, a scholarship for college and were able to play, you know, year after year after year. And then you got, uh, you're getting a huge salary now and can devote your life to playing. That's why you're a good player. Oh, no, I am a good player. You say, but you, uh, you won't say I'm delinquent. But you, by God, you're not going to be robbed of, of your reputation as a great player. Uh, I think there's something inconsistent there. And I think the way to straighten it out is either uh, to uh, hold everyone responsible for what they do and give everyone credit for what they do. And I, I don't think we're willing to do that. And uh, I would prefer the other. And I think I, I, I think it's, 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 it's good to be proud of what you've done. It's good to be ashamed of what you've done. These are cultural practices which have got you to do things. I, I would praise people, even though I don't think what I'm praising is anything more than something that will be changed by my praise. My, I, I will be, uh, if, you, if you say, great, then that's more likely to be done next time, you see. Almost any school of psychotherapy or behavior therapy or religion or philosophy yeah. that I know of emphasizes they, uh, saying to people, you have choices. Today yes. is the beginning, of, is the first day of the rest of your yeah. life. You yeah. have choices. You can choose where you're going to go with your life yeah. from here. Do you, do you think that there's any sense in which people do have choices? Well, there are situations in which there are different things that can be done. And one of them will be done. And you call it a choice. Now, you can also do something called decision-making, which is to work on yourself or the setting so that one thing or the other is done. You're stuck between two things, like Balaam's ass, and you've got to do something to do one or the other or you'll die. And so you fiddle around, this, bag, this, this one over here looks better, I like to go, I'm right-handed, I'll go to the right, or you'll do something that gets 
gets you to respond. And you say, I, I decided what to do, and I made my choice. But these are entirely determined by environmental events. So the interesting the correlate of what you're saying, though, is that people don't want to injure a belief in choice, and so they turn to ineffective methods. Teachers don't want to teach because that injures the student's creative learning. This goes way back, Comenius, back three or four hundred years ago. The more the teacher teaches, the less the student learns. But you want students to learn, so you mustn't teach. That's Carl Rogers said as much as that. In his own field, he said as much as that, too. You want the individual, the, the client, to be the one who will come up with a solution. If you give him the solution, you, you've robbed him of the ability to, to find it for himself. This is true of, of all claims for creativity and so on. If you show an influence, oh yes, he was influenced by so uh, then you've robbed him of, of some originality. I mean, we try so hard to keep that imagined inner entity or, or ego working in a given way. I mean, now we don't want to take credit away. And my book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, was a demonstration of how much damage that has done to our cultures. Um, how do you explain the fact that uh, people don't do what they're told to do. They have to, in some yeah, sense, yeah. find their own yeah. solution. Oh, well, uh, well, first of all, make the distinction between rule governed and contingency shaped behavior. Uh, teachers construct situations in which students do things for irrelevant reasons because later on they will do them and get good reasons to follow. So that it's a matter, really, of, of priming the behavior, which is then truly taken over. Now, that can be done in the school. And if the school builds up behavior which does pay off in the world at large, it's a good school. And so you teach people to analyze situations, describe them, extract from them rules to follow. Then the consequences follow, too. And from that point on, you have originated something in the sense that you have got yourself to do something that did pay off. But how many people know how to find rules from the contingencies they face? That's what, that should be taught. But it's not teaching creativity. It's teaching the manipulation of a world verbally, which then leads to action, which is then followed by consequences. So you always come out with a behavior followed by consequences or you haven't got anywhere. You're just following rules is nothing. When you don't like to follow rules, I don't like to follow rules. But if somebody tells me to do something and I do it and consequences follow, I may even say thank you for telling me. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a crucial topic in current behavioral thinking and research and, mm. and theorizing, so I'd like to spend a little more time on it. What, what do you mean by a rule? You, you've introduced the distinction between rule governed and contingency yes. shaped behavior. Once you can talk about behavior and talk about the world, you can help other people come into effective contact with the world and with the origin of verbal behavior in the human species only. Enormous advances were made because it was no longer up to the individual to learn everything through what happens to him as an individual or her. Um, and you get then a culture forming which primes behavior, models behavior, gets the behavior out so that uh, things can happen that have happened in the first place only rarely to one person and now happen to everyone. Somebody first discovered something about something. That would have been the end and it, would up, and it might have been a very difficult contingency that taught it. If it hadn't been put down and transferred as a rule in, in, uh, in texts or passed down by rules verbally and so on. The, what has happened to our, what is called a culture is that there has evolved an enormous source of rules which, if you follow, will lead you to do things that will be reinforced. Science does that too. Uh, 
Uh, science is nothing but a complex set of rules for a of action. Governments have rules which uh, get you to do what they won't punish you <laughs> for doing. Uh, religions have rules the same kind of things. In, in business, you've got uh, all of the prices and all of these kinds of things, which are agreements, verbal agreements as to what is going to happen, what you will get if you pay so much and so on. It's all rule-governed behavior. And cognitive psychologists psychologists have taken it over now. They study how people follow rules, but not with the contingencies showing. Uh, but you only follow rules for good reasons. Uh, that it would be that you have to be You've had, your behavior of following rules must have been reinforced somehow or other. And that gets you into a difference between the behavior which is contingency shaped, and that's the real behavior. That's when you're doing things because consequences have followed when you've done it. And following rules, which is temporary. You follow the rule and then the consequences follow and you're there. You come to uh, the Cambridge, say, I like uh, good Italian food, and I say, well, go to Luigi's, very good food. That's advice, that's a rule. It's just a description of what will happen if you go to Luigi's. You go and get good food, and from that point on, if you go again, it's not because of, my, of the rule at all, it's because of the food you got. And that's, that's all of science is that. Somebody discovers you do it this way and something will happen. Very unusual, very rare contingency, but accidental. And, but after that, it's no longer accidental, now you do it because of the rules. It's, a, it's all, all in, the, in, in the, my book on verbal behavior, but I didn't get it out quite that far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you've, you've also talked about it at, at other times, uh, uh, book learning versus practical behavior. Uh, yes, well, there's an old distinction between knowledge by description and knowledge by experience. That's it. Knowledge by description is rule-governed knowledge. Mm -hmm. You do things because you've been they, the consequences have been described, mm -hmm. and that's what cognitive people, cognitive science, the, the cognition in cognitive science is knowledge by description. They describe settings, what would you do, and so on. Mm -hmm. But knowledge by experience is operant conditioning. That's what, it, what changes take place in an organism when contingencies have been imposed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to produce it, mm -hmm. produce the behavior. We've all seen kids so commonly, and I've occasionally seen it in my adult friends as well, where you start to show them how to do something, and they say, don't do it for me, I'll do it myself. Yes, exactly. Why? Well, because uh, they would prefer, uh, it's, it's more fun to be contingency shaped uh, than to, to follow rules. Think of, think of how much we tell, tell kids to do. Oh, you clean your teeth this morning, go clean your teeth, now sit down, don't, 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 don't uh, wash your hands and so on. We, we boss them around where, where no good contingencies do follow. The teeth weren't bothering him <laughs> at the moment, or the, uh, or the hands weren't, weren't interfering with eating and all of this. So that uh, we, we have a burden of, of just too many rules which are followed with nothing else happening to reinforce following them. And so we attack those who give us the rules. Uh, I've been supplying you with prompts for your verbal behavior, but there must be things that you would like to share with us that I have failed to prompt. So what else would you like to tell us about that has to do with <laughs> verbal behavior? Well, I suppose uh, if you allowed me, I would get around to my battle with the cognitive psychologist, because it is essentially verbal concerning verbal behavior. They have given up on behavior as a function of the setting and what has happened in the past to talk about verbal behavior. You describe settings and you ask them to say what they would, in, would expect to happen, what would they would intend to do, and so on. Now I think that is a, that's moving right into the field of verbal behavior and forgetting all about what the operant people study, which is real situations and real behavior. And that reminds me now, oh, you, they're giving me a free reign here, of a very, another very important point. Many people, especially the animal activists now, are saying, you can do all of these experiments with human beings, why do you have to use animals? My answer to that is absolutely the opposite. You can't do these experiments with human beings, you must do them with animals, 
or with nonverbal human beings, of which you don't have many, unless you work with very small children or very atypical people. And the reason is a situation in which people find themselves. And what happens then is that they analyze the situations and begin to say something about it. Mm -hmm. And they may give themselves rules to follow. Mm -hmm. And then what they do from that point on is a response to the setting you have created and to the rules they have created for themselves. So that there is the only research on human subjects that I think feasible is precisely that point of what people do in analyzing situations and giving themselves rules which modify their contingency shaped behavior. Now I think it's all the basic the basic behavioral processes are all available in the animal laboratory. All of them. And they let's see, I've used nothing but those processes in my book on verbal behavior. That is where you study it. That is, that is where you study how the brain works, if you want to put it that way, or how the organism as a whole works, as I want to put it. And given that, you can then interpret what's going on in daily life, both in terms of the contingencies which prevail as such, or the contingencies which generate verbal behavior and responses to the products of verbal behavior. I think it's a very important point. Only the animal laboratory, really, can get down to the basic processes of behavior. That, the, the I, basic I, I, I put that true, and I would say that was true of, uh, of perception, too. I think the work that's been done, uh, Hernstein's work on pattern discrimination, and con what he calls concept formation, I wouldn't call it that, I think the concept's in the apparatus, not on the pigeon, but that is a much more precise study of how behavior is brought under the control of stimuli than to bring people into a setting and try to convert them into, as the old Wundtians did, into the skilled observer who didn't take the stimulus into account. That was the stimulus error. If you take what you remember about stimuli, you'll spoil the research. Of course, the perception people came along and did that too, and what you perceive, the way you perceive something is not the way it is, but the way it seems to you. And all that means is not the way it is, but the way it is plus all of this happened to you in similar situations throughout your life. That is why you respond to it as a perception instead of, but I think you only can get, you can get back to the basic processes only with nonverbal organisms. And that's basic a, in the sense of not contaminated by not being terminated by talking about it or, be, or having been influenced by what was said to you and so on. Uh -huh. but, you're not, but you're not suggesting that it isn't worthwhile once you understand the basic processes or as you're studying the basic processes. It's worthwhile to also study how people make use of verbal behavior. Oh, well, you teach verbal behavior, yes. And you, you teach them to follow instructions. You teach them to respond to descriptions of contingency. You, we do this with children all the time. And we could do it much better than we do in schools if we, if we recognize the nature of the problem. You call it rules uh, in uh, other people might call some of what you've talked about um, self-fulfilling prophecy. Once you've said that something, then you, then you do it that way because you've said so. Well, that would be an example. I don't like the word rules, but it's, what I really mean is Verbal behavior control behavior, but mm -hmm. that's a little awkward. Mm -hmm. And I'm settling for rules just mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a standard term. There's a whole field of uh, psychological research on what's called problem solving or concept formation. You know, people are yes. shown cards with curly lines or straight lines and red borders or blue borders yeah. and so on. Um, and and uh, what people do in trying to identify the critical features of yeah. the stimuli is often called hypothesis making. Yes. Um, how would you talk about that? Well, a hypothesis is something supposed to be inside. And that's why I object to that, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, the old word association is a good, a good example. This is a very simple example. 
Pavlov's dogs associated the bell with the food. Not at all. Pavlov associated them. Associate means to put together. And it was Pavlov who did that. The interesting thing is that having associated <laughs> the bell with the food, the dog begins to respond to the bell. Now that is not association by the dog, it's associated by Pavlov. The same thing is true of concept formation. Um, the various uh, Ernstein's experiment, very, very fascinating experiment. You show a pigeon hundreds of slides, in some of which there are people, and in others not. And in a surprising short of time, the pigeons will respond in one way to, uh, to a slide with a person in it, and another way to, to a slide without. Now, it's a mistake to say, though, I think, that the pigeon has acquired the concept of person. The concept is in the apparatus. The concept was formed when you reinforced responses to slides with people and extinguished responses with, to slides without people. You, you formed the concept. The remarkable thing is that pigeons can respond in that different way, but without having a concept in the head to help them. Well, is that true of people as well then? I mean, in what sense? When should we apply the word concept? When, when can we say, if ever, mm -hmm. that people have concepts yeah. or that a pigeon mm -hmm. has a concept? Yeah. Well, a concept is the process, is the product of conception. And uh, that is a metaphor that uh, is, is, rather, is really relevant here. Something is supposed to have happened in you for the first time. Uh, and it's like all mentalistic concepts, there are environmental explanations which take over the origination of something inside. But it was the environment, it was the contingency, the reinforcement, which led to the behavior. And a concept is something we make up as a name for the change in us, which as a result of which we now behave in a different way. You see, we don't store memories, we simply are changed organisms. We don't acquire concepts, we are changed organisms. The pigeon that will respond to people and not to people is a changed pigeon. And we've changed it by differential reinforcement with respect to visual presentations. It's uh, the, the, there is, of course, a change that will eventually be discovered by brain scientists a hundred years from now, perhaps, uh, when they get to that fineness of control, uh, and that I leave it to them. I, I, I believe in brain science. I don't believe in philosophy or, or concept formation. I guess I, I'm still curious to pursue thinking uh, a little more. I have two questions. Is there a difference between verbal thinking and nonverbal thinking? And is there a difference between human thinking and the thinking of other species? Well, since I have no way of knowing about the thinking of other species as something they observe, and I can, I can both observe what I do and also what I am thinking at the time, I, I'm not quite sure how that could be answered. However, I would distinguish between the way I am thinking when I am inventing a piece of apparatus as a gadget, and I, I, I do things without actually doing them, in a sense, I th almost always, as visualizing the consequences of doing, I see myself putting things together in certain ways and seeing whether that's square and whether this is likely to move without hitting this and so on. And all of that is perceptual behavior, which is very hard to make people understand as behavior. But it is what I would do if I had the pieces there and what I would see if I saw my, if, if I were doing it with the pieces. And I, of course, I can't do it as well without the pieces. That's why I would eventually get around to making it, making a model to see whether it works or not. I invented a very complex uh, uh, machine, the teaching machine, in the middle 50s. It's now in the Smithsonian. It is full of gadgetry of all kinds. I drew all of the parts for the construction of that 
that one summer in Maine, there was nothing but squared paper available. Every single part in there, uh, dimensions and exact specifications and so on. It took, uh, it took a machinist a full year to make the parts and put them together. It was very slight adjustments, it worked. Now, that's the thing, I, I love doing that. Um, if I had had a shop on Monhegan, a machine shop working with metal and so on, I would have, it would have made it instead of drawing lines and visualizing the parts. But uh, I was doing things that in both cases. The fact that nobody could see me when I was just drawing lines and uh, they couldn't see what I was seeing, these, these drawings didn't look at all like the, the parts when they were finally made. Uh, nevertheless, I, it was a kind of, of behavior. The behavior I've always enjoyed doing and, and done well enough so I get a lot of reinforcement out of it. Some people might find it impossible to do, I dare say. But I, there are other things I'm in, I can't do, too. I, I, uh, I can't think music as, uh, except when I'm hearing it. I discovered that I, I can, if, I used to play uh, piano and I had an electric organ, too. If, but I couldn't read a Mozart's sonata and hear it. Um, like sit down and play it and hear it. But I discovered that if I turned off the sound of my electric organ and played it, I could hear it. Oh, really? Uh, That's uh, the, uh, the movement of my hands uh, yeah. brought the auditory behavior that, that, that worked very well. Uh -huh. Well, you can, you can imagine then how in a professional musician the behavior could be shaped of looking at the notes on the printed page and hearing the music. Oh, yes, or how, uh, of course, Beethoven wrote the Ninth Symphony totally deaf. He never heard it. <laughs> and uh, he may have heard some deep vibrations of some kind, but yet he composed it, uh, I'm sure, but it was hearing it as he composed it. But he never heard it through his ears. Mm -hmm. You describe with great delight uh, the way um, your, your enjoyment at working with your hands in yes. the shop. Um, I think there are psychologists who would say that shows up in your particular science of behavior, oh, that, yeah. that it has a kind of mechanical flavor. Do you think that your own personal enjoyment at gadgetry mm. and making practical things that work, um, and that had to have preceded your ever coming well, into uh, psychology. Uh, Did that influence uh, the way mm. the science of operant behavior developed? Well, it influenced the way research was carried out because I could throw an apparatus together with very little time. If it wasn't working, I could change it. If, it. if I ran into something else, I could scrap it and build something else quickly and so on. So I didn't have to call in a machinist and have him do something so I could do some research. And uh, certainly all of that early stuff uh, was just junk that I put together with an extraordinary number of lucky accidents as a result. The most, the most obvious one, I made a, a dispenser of food pellets for a rat by taking an old disc of food I found in a junk pile, a wood, a, a circular piece of wood, and drilled holes, and I arranged it so this would step along and drop one piece out every time. It just happened there was a spindle on that piece of wood, and I left it on. And then it occurred to me, after I began to get uh, records of how fast the animal was, was working for food, uh, with marks like this, and it occurred to me, if I put a string around that spindle, I could have the pen drop and get a curve. Well, now that's just, just, that is ex extraordinary luck, because it is the curve from which the slope is a measure of probability or rate of responding that proved to be so, certainly in my own thinking, very important. So that was, that's gadgetry. It is due to uh, my building things. If I were sitting around, like Wittgenstein, say, playing with words or whatever he played with, uh, uh, it would be a very different thing, of course. Wittgenstein did say at one point, you know, that it will take some animal research to answer these questions. We've come this far in the discussion, and we are supposed to be talking about verbal behavior, and yet I haven't, 
ask you to explain your definition of verbal behavior and how it differs from mm -hmm. nonverbal behavior. Could you do that for us? Yes. First, however, I, I want to correct you. You said uh, my book was about verbal behavior or language. Now, in the book, I defined a language as a verbal culture. It is people speaking, texts read, and so on, which alter the behavior of, of speakers. Uh, language, English, English language is not saying anything, not speaking. I do speak English. In other words, what I say as verbal behavior has been shaped by English as a verbal environment. And when I speak French, that has been shaped by, alas, not the French environment, but book learning and so on. Uh, the languages are on the side of the reinforcing contingencies. And when you study language, you study current practices in the verbal community, which is not speaking at all, but reinforcing speaking. And that is why linguists have so often confined themselves almost entirely to the behavior of the listener. Uh, Chomsky and others, is this, is this a grammatical sentence? That's not a question about verbal behavior. It's a question about the listener or the reader. Is, that, is a listener or a reader responding effectively to that particular verbal pattern? And so they begin to analyze the structure of the language. And as is structuralism of, of the worst kind. Now, meanwhile, someone has had to be speaking, and that is the product of what listeners have done over years of, uh, of contact with the speaker. The verbal behavior is behavior. A language is the word for a verbal environment, and it is studied as such, and has always been studied as such, by linguists. There are all the languages in the world, that doesn't mean all of the verbal behavior that's been going on. It means these are the cultures which have shaped different kinds of verbal behavior. Now, verbal behavior is what I'm doing right now. I'm making noises. And I'm making the noises which have had certain kinds of consequences. The first time I said Dada, my father was in ecstasy, I dare say. Oh, he called me Dada. And so I was hugged and uh, given all sorts of goodies and so on. And ever since, I went on calling him Dada or Daddy. Actually, it was Papa, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's not quite so easy for a child to say Papa, apparently. But anyway, the, my whole <laughs> repertoire has been shaped by the kinds of consequences that have followed. And those kinds of consequences are the things which have created general principles to all languages. The fact that there are universals is made a great deal of, that all languages have certain common features. Of course they have, because there are common reasons why people have reinforced my behaviors in these various ways. And there are, in all languages, there are questions. Uh, what did you say? Uh, or what is that? Um, in all languages, there are negations. Uh, no, not that. Um, in all languages, there are things talked about. <laughs> there are actions talked about, and so on and so on. Um, these are the universals, because they are the universals of the contingencies of reinforcement responsible for verbal behavior, not any one particular set, such as Greek or Latin or, or French or English. What's the definition then of verbal, be of verbal behavior? Well, verbal, verbal behavior is behavior which differs from nonverbal behavior in the nature of its reinforcement. If I touch that glass and pick it up, I've got a glass in my hand. And I could have done that if there had been glasses before the species ever acquired verbal behavior. If I say, hand me that glass, please, and someone hands it to me, I, my, my response, hand me that glass, 
was reinforced by someone else. Now that uh, reaching and picking that up shapes some very specific muscles in my hand and some related to some strict stimuli from, from the glass to my eyes and so on. Nothing of that sort is involved if I say, hand me the glass, please. Uh, so my verbal behavior is going to be very different. It's, it's shaping my muscles here in different patterns, but only in ways which have produced certain consequences in a quite different way. So the behavior shaped by contingencies of reinforcement like that as one kind of thing, the behavior of vocal behavior shaped by consequences will be very different. And that is why uh, my book simply traces all of the differences between verbal behavior and nonverbal behavior which come from that distinction. From the fact that the reinforcers are mediated somebody from the else, Somebody the else was, must be, you know, no solitary person ever began to talk. Mm -hmm. Is the behavior of the listener verbal then? I would say no, uh, except when uh, you are speaking along with the speaker, and we do that a great deal. Uh, if we hear people sing the Star Spangled Banner before a ball game, we're probably saying it along with what we're hearing mm -hmm. if we are very loyal people. Um, and when we read a poem we know very well, we are seeing it, seeing it along with, uh, with the speaker. Uh, it's, um, even though he may be dead for several hundred years, uh, he said it, and, and in reading it, you are saying it. You're not just responding to it. The first time you responded to it, you had no, no cues to, to lead you to say it yourself. First time you read a poem, you word after word. But after that, just you've heard this and done this a thousand times, you're ahead of the text, and the text is prompting. Or you may forget it and just recite the poem. Then you, then you are the listener, who, the reader who is saying it. I'm going to come back to the question of the list, the speaker and the listener. All right. Uh, you may remember that it has puzzled me for some time. Many people would 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 say, I probably you you and I would agree that the, the what the listener does is every bit as complicated as what the speaker does. But you're saying that it's of a, in what way is it different, except for not making noise? Well, the the listener is responding to stimuli. For example, I'm a cook, and I, and I either ring the triangular bell, chow is ready, or I just call out, chow. Now, what's the difference between coming to the bell or coming to the, uh, the sounds I make? Both are verbal, though, because I don't ring bells unless people do come. But on the side of the listener, it's no more verbal than coming when the tea kettle whistles. You, you uh, do respond to one thing because something else has accompanied it in the past. And I don't see verbal, uh, I don't see listeners doing things that they don't do to nonverbal environments. They may not be doing things, I mean, picking up a glass and handing it to you, mm -hmm. uh, I could do, as you say, whether or not you had asked for the glass of water, yeah. but it's all, the argument is often made uh, by psycholinguists that we're dealing with, with, quotes, language in two forms, the productive side, re the receptive side, um, or the comprehension side. If, if you as you do, speak in long, complicated, academic sentences, yeah. um, I have to, quotes, process that stream of sound to make sense of it. You have been af affected by cognitive psychologists. Are you processing? What does that mean? Are you grinding wheat? Are you dis distilling oil? What, what is this process? Um, you are doing something, yes, and I can. If I, have to, I if I don't start with you now to discover this, I start with you as a small child. 
uh, whose mother said, dinner is ready. And you came and, or she said, stop doing that, and you stopped. You, you learn to do, you learn to stop doing in response to stimuli, which would be just as much as uh, not touching something if it's hot or, or picking something up when it looks appetizing and so on. You are responding to stimuli in terms of what has happened to you when you responded to them in the past. And that's not verbal behavior. It happens to be verbal stimuli because they were produced by a speaker, but that doesn't, mean, that doesn't make any difference in what you're doing and the nature of what you're doing. Well then, uh, whether we call it verbal or not, let's, let's confine the term verbal to that which the speaker well, does. Well, I think the speaker is very, really, the listener is very important. Yeah. I have a paper that I gave at Arbo last year on the, on the behavior of the listener. I think it needs to be looked at very closely, and I may have neglected it a bit in my book, but I was talking about verbal behavior, which is the behavior of the speaker. I was assuming the kinds of consequences that shape that behavior. Um, we haven't yet come to talking about the, a new field of research that has risen in the last couple of decades on the verbal capacities of non-human species. Yes. You and your associates taught a small bit of verbal behavior to two mm. pigeons. Irene Pepperberg is teaching verbal skills to a parrot. Lewis Herman to dolphins. Ron Schusterman to sea lions. I've taught a dozen verbal responses to a monkey, and several exceptionally dedicated research teams have taught extensive verbal repertoires to some chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this work? Can it teach us anything basic about verbal behavior, or do you think it's just a demonstration of our animal training skills? Well, I have always supposed that other species can engage in verbal behavior. And I think you could say that my book proves it if the book is a valid account because in it I discuss a wide range of kinds of verbal behavior from poetry to logic to military commands to casual conversations, all in terms of processes first discovered in research on animals. Now, it doesn't surprise me at all if you can show me uh, something like verbal behavior in other species, but I think there are two restrictions. I think you've got to teach it because no other species has developed a language and remember, I'm talking about a verbal culture when I say language. I don't believe that chimpanzees have a language which is not due to natural selection rather than operant conditioning. And that's a very big distinction. I don't question the language of bees or the language of territorial markers and so on and so on. Those things have proved to be important for the species, and they have evolved through natural selection, survival as a consequence, well-being of the individual and survival of the species, and that is that. But they have never developed a language in the sense of a verbal environment which reinforces verbal behavior. That's very important, I think. Um, in the case of the chimps, it's very, you, you can also, well, I think you could also say this for almost all of the species, that only in the human species is the vocal musculature under operant control. Now, there are pairs of minor birds and so on that imitate sounds, and once they have done that, you can reinforce particular patterns to get something very, which looks more like uh, human verbal behavior. However, you can use sign languages or lexicons and so on, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and get the same thing in animals that can't control their vocal apparatus. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's that. Now, how far can you go in teaching? Well, that all depends upon how much time you have uh, to arrange the equivalent 
of the verbal environment, which the species doesn't have. And I think the one good reason uh, why they haven't developed that is that the consequences are always slightly deferred, and that makes it very, I don't think you can, I, I would assert this, and I think it's very, I like to have ethologists uh, answer me on this. Is there any species that models behavior not because of natural selection, but because of the operant consequences? I doubt it. I, uh, you know, the experiment with the, the monkeys that started washing the, the, the sweet potatoes, one did, uh, an accident, I suppose, that uh, a sweet potato in salt water tasted better with a little salt and was also cleaner and less gritty. Uh, but that, that young monkey went on doing that. Uh, it was never imitated by adults because they don't imitate young. It was imitated by other young. And then when they grew older, the young began to imitate them and then they all eventually uh, practice this, but it, and that was due to operant reinforcement. That was not an evolved practice, and could be it would be a mistake, mistake to call it a, a, an instinct. If you came upon that, you'd say they had an instinct, unless you knew something about the history, of course. Now that, uh, but I don't believe even then that one of those monkeys ever showed another monkey how to, uh, or to hold it to, or coerced it, forced it to do this. I just don't think the consequences of showing, modeling, are quick enough to have been effective in any other species except man. Now, I'd like to know whether that, you can always say something looked like it, but do you find a regular standard practice? Of course you do uh, at the level of natural selection. Some birds fly where their young can see them and they're more likely by imitating them to fly sooner. That's, that's modeling, uh, no question about that, and that is, it is the survival of the species that makes a difference. And the problem there is that that is, it is always a, it's always a deferred, deferred consequence. The survival of the species, or even the survival of the individual, is always a deferred consequence. But natural selection can work that way. But deferred consequences cannot work on operant conditioning. I don't think animals model behavior, and I don't think they talk to each other unless someone has constructed very specific contingencies of reinforcement. And that's, of course, what these people working with chimpanzees do. Um, I want to pursue deferred consequences. You didn't, you didn't intend to say that deferred consequences cannot work in the human case, can you? I mean, a verbal organism mm. can be controlled by deferred consequences. But because of the verbal behavior, you see, I don't believe, I have a big conflict, uh, conflict here with my colleague, Richard Hernstein, I don't believe that net gain ever explains behavior. And net gain, how you come out in the long run, is a product of certain contingencies of reinforcement which are immediate. And there are very good reasons why those immediate consequences have have evolved because they have, in general, produced a net gain for the culture. Net gains are cultural consequences which work only through mediation. If you do this, you, this will happen. Okay, then I do it because I have learned in response to those if-then statements to do because consequences have followed when I have done. But without the verbal mediation, I don't think any human being is modified by what happens an hour later, let alone a month later, or at the end of his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it happens. I, th I can't imagine how it could have evolved to happen that way. I, th I think the, the ongoing behavior has got to be somehow still ongoing to have the reinforcement affected. And in, in my work with rats, uh, three or four seconds begins to damage the whole thing very much, and even then, it may very well be that there are conditioned mediators. Uh, Furster and I got a pigeon to do something where something had happened 50 minutes later, but we had to move up second by second to get that. And you're, you do this now because the condition that follows was something you, you could do something in and so on and so on. You learn to do something because it produces a condition under which something will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And then you have to stretch that 
period of time out very slowly in the process we call shaping. Mm -hmm. Shaping and chaining, you're talking yes, about. Yes, right. Yes. Um, you said that the, how far we can take other organisms, other species, uh, into a verbal mm -hmm. into verbal behavior no. uh, depends upon how long we have to train them. Yes. Do you think that uh, there would be no theoretical limits or no practical limits on how far we can teach uh, another species? Right. Well, I think it's like Chomsky saying that there are an infinite number of sentences, uh, but that you have to say given an infinite number of, amount of time. Uh, and uh, I can't say on this, but I, I would, would make some estimates. Uh, there was someone a long time ago who taught dogs to do things in response to verbal instructions and claimed something of the order of, of, of 100 or more responses. The dog's a listener, though, remember, mm -hmm. in that case, not a speaker. Mm -hmm. Now, you can get, uh, if you can get different kinds of responses, which are really distinguishable as, and of course, one of the great advantages of verbal behavior is the patterning that makes possible thousands of responses in a very short, of a very small size. If you can get several of those, you can get a pigeon, someone has done this recently, you get a pigeon to stand on one foot or to flip one wing and so on. These are words. Uh, you stand on one foot for something, you flip your wing for something else, you nod your head for something else and so on. It can be done, that's the sign language of the pigeon. Uh, you can build up a reasonable repertoire, but you very soon run into trouble. How many different responses have you got? And I'm sure that the sign language is a problem too there because uh, there, there's a point at which they're no longer distinguishable f functionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, they tend to be, even in the human sign language, they tend to be rather sketchy kinds of, of things. But if you could, it is a question of how many different topographies of response are available and how much time have you to bring them under the control of, one, different consequences to ask for different things, two, different, uh, different settings in which they are reinforced, tacting in the terms of my book. That is, uh, you say this when the color is red, you say that when the color is blue, you say that when the color is green, and so on. Do you know the names of the colors? Well, you build, build up, you have, maybe by the time you get to 12 or 13, you're getting very, very close on the colors and they won't have the fancy names like mauve and whatnot, but you could go quite a long way and I don't see any reasonable limit there except the limit, your limit or the limit of some apparatus you can make to do this more precisely. Uh, you could have, if the pigeon is pecking the names of things, I've done it with four, four colors. You turn it on, the pigeon pecks red or you know, whatever the color is, it does it very well. And you could, if you had a much bigger array as, the, uh, as, as it can be done with, with chimps and so on, you can get naming of a large number of things or properties of things. You can get man's asking for things, naming for things, and uh, you can get repetition. Uh, you do it and, and the organism does it. This is what happens when you teach someone how to say something. Uh, say, uh, say uncle and you say uncle. And, uh, that can be that echoic behavior. You can build that up. Uh, you, I doubt very much whether you can get what I call intraverbal behavior. It, after you have uh, spoken many, many uh, words and read many, many things and so on, there are certain tendencies for the topographies to be together. If, you're, if, you're in the, if you are in a situation in which you may say house you may very well say home too. So if I ask you to respond to me without repeating what I say, and I say house, you say home. And people almost invariably do that. There are standard things, colors, red, and so on. Uh, this is due to the frequency of, of contiguity, how often they have been together in a large repertoire. Well, you'd have to have a very large repertoire with a chimp before you you got that. You could, you could teach it to say house when you say home, but that's not intraverbal. That's just general. It's a response that has been set up by 
specific contingencies, intraverbals or something which come about through generalized contingencies of a very large, very great variety. Hmm. And when you go, when you get beyond that to what I call the autocritics and so on, I see no, I see no hope of building that up. Why? If I, if I say to you, as I just said, and I say something, as I just said, has the effect of alerting you to the fact that you are going to hear something again that I know and I'm not just repeating myself because I'm an idiot and so on, or that you haven't under responded so I'm saying it again and so on. Um, as, uh, to repeat, as I've just said, uh, those are, are autocritics in the sense that they affect what I'm going to say and make it have a different effect on you. And of course, they're extremely common. And uh, they're very much a part of ordinary discourse. Well, I can't believe that you're going to get uh, a chimp to say, uh, as I said before, that's red. <laughs> Point to red. Uh, there's no, the contingencies which lead me to say it are very subtle. There's much too big a repertoire needed. Oh, so you, so you do think there are differences between species in the size of the repertoires they can? Well, uh, I, I, think it, I think it's far beyond any other species because we have to teach them everything. You see, we, we are, our verbal behavior, Chomsky thinks I think we have to teach everybody what everything they say, but our verbal behavior is a product of an enormous contact for thousands of hours with speaking people. And that's where a lot of this comes from. You won't find very small children using many autocritics. They will, as their verbal behavior becomes more subtle, then they will begin to use them. Mm -hmm. Smooths over many misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you've given examples of autocritics of a type that is a sort of um, meta-commentary on what's what is being said, and yes. as you said, it affects the way the listener responds. Mm -hmm. What about grammatical patterning in general, which is an issue of still a hot issue in the, in the psychology of language? What, but what is the nature of grammatical be behavior? Well, I think this autocritic is the answer to that. As you speak, you, you push the listener around by putting things in your speech so that the listener will respond in ways which will be reinforcing to you. And I think that's what grammar is. If I say house, uh, house blue, I don't know, house white instead of white house, it isn't because uh, I'm applying grammar, but because I've grown up in a world in which I've thousands of times said white house and perhaps millions of times heard white house or read white house, rather than white than house white. These are, are the ways we do things in a, in a particular culture. You've got to put one or the other in. The Latin didn't need, didn't need it. You, there you, had to, you had to agree. The word for house had to agree with the word for white. When you could put anywhere you wanted in, uh, in Latin. The famous passage, lente, lente, what is it? Oh, I've forgotten it now, but... Uh, Lente, lente, curate noctis, noctis equi. Slowly, slowly run horses of the night. As you, uh, the night is supposed to, the sun was carried across somewhere in the, uh, and started again the next day, you see. Mm -hmm. Now we say it precisely the other way around. Uh, uh, horses of the night run slowly, slowly. Uh, you use horses uh, as an address. All horses of the night run slowly, slowly. Now, we can do that. We do that because that's the way we, have, we make sentences. Uh, in Latin, you could do it because that sounded good, you see. Mm -hmm. it, didn't, it didn't have to be in a particular order, and that was a terrific advantage for a, a language that has uh, grammar of that kind, which identifies adjectives with nouns and verbs with tenses and whatnot and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but this has all been, been worked out. It's just a way of being effective, of doing the kinds of things that will produce a result. 
So when you speak about verbal behavior, you're not talking only about little pieces of verbal, little responses, uh, a given noun form or a given verb form. Is there any limit then to the size or complexity of uh, of responding that could qualify as a unitary functional operant? Well, if you're asking me to say that we are all egalitarian and that chimpanzees are the equal of, of uh, human beings, I would say no, as I would say that human beings are not equal to their other. I don't suppose that an autistic, a severely autistic child could ever acquire a, an adequate repertoire for daily life, let alone read Shakespeare. No, there are differences, and they are differences in ability and in how well things are taught and how much time there is to teach. I, th I think uh, schools are a disaster because they take too much time to teach what they teach. And then it's not a fair judgment to say that the students aren't bright and aren't learning and so on. They're not teaching. And that can, they can be taught faster. And, and uh, we could all not only learn to read very much faster than we do, but enjoy reading rather than struggle to, un to read a want ad. Is, as a, if you do that, you can graduate from a New York high school. Where do you, what do you think uh, are critical areas for research on verbal behavior in the future? Where, what should we be mm -hmm. working on and focusing on? Well, of course, I never thought anything would be uh, on verbal behavior as such. It would be on the processes, the basic processes, which produce verbal behavior. And I think it's, it's what is being done now, and there is a, there's a special interest group that is, is publishing a journal on, on verbal behavior, as, as I define it, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all very, very good, and it will be certainly, uh, it will certainly deal with how verbal responses affect other verbal responses or nonverbal behavior. And I think that's very important, how children acquire behavior, either as a developmentalist ought to be doing it by how, how it turns up in an ordinary daily life environment, or how fast it could be taught by designing a more effective contingency to reinforcement. That's essentially what I've done with these centers which teach reading much, much faster, about twice as fast as classrooms can teach it. That's producing verbal behavior of a, of a kind, a textual behavior. No question that can be done. And it ought to be done in our schools because we're not, not teaching reading well enough to make it possible for them to learn much else. Uh, I think we've run out. I think we've run out too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very much. It's been a very enjoyable discussion. Oh, that's for and me too. I know that uh, oh, I, I our thank students you. Are, uh, and other people are going to be enjoy. Thank sharing you. This. I hope they do.